Oh, Thelema, you're such a strange conglomerate to the outsider and riddled, like all systems, with countless thoughts and new opinions, as vast as there are partakers in studying you, living like a prime thought, slung into the wind and taken by whomever chooses it. In no other slighted way am I really any different, adding here and detracting there, all for the sake of molding the information into a cognizable framework. Interestingly, though, your metaphysics rest easy on my mind, and they're very soft to the touch. So today, I'm going to share those thoughts. I will expand on what it is that I find interesting in Thelema. And of course, considering me, I'm going to go to what I believe is a grand symbol of the feminine nature, or as you call it, Babylon. With all that being said, my name is River. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the video, and of course, welcome to the Nimiton. With all talks, I often wonder where to even begin. But thankfully, the mystical aspects allow it to be evident. We start at the top. It would be unjust of me to ignore the origin of metaphysical tears, therefore, we're going to go ahead and kick things off with Nuit. For those who don't know, Nuit, the speaker of the first section of Thelema's Book of the Law, represents a particular emanated aspect of the Divine Feminine. To expand on this part, Suf, we should look onto the Kabbalistic chain of being, noting that the revealment of Shekinah is in the first emanation from Ein Sof, which appears to the process that we call Simsum, or the Divine Contraction. To understand why this is the feminine aspect, we turn to the natures of Hadith and Rahor Kui. Generally, we could say that Hadith is the prime masculine nature akin to Hulkmah, and is therefore tangentially connected to Rahor Kui akin to Kether. This is extremely similar to how Arik on Pin funnels his essence through Yasod to Elohim, energizing that part Suf. Then, so too does Hadit generate Nuit and funnels its generative aspect through that. I address this more in my Kabbalah creation video, yet fortunately, they are nearly identical. Noting this, we may realize that we've actually skipped a step. How is it? it that Hadith generates Nuit, yet the Shekinah is revealed at the Simsum, which occurs before, like, any emanation. It's because Kether is really imperceivable, and Shekinah is not perfectly analogous to one part Sufim of the Divine Feminine, rather it is the all form or collective of the Divine Feminine. In a sense, essentially, there is a higher nature, of which Nuit is a lower reflection of, only because of human limitations and mental capacity. We may comfortably call this a perfect or negatively existent void space, which is fueled by the ore of Ein Sulf, which descends down into it via the Kav. Noting all these factors of Nuit, we see a certain personification of it, as we would see between Ima and Elohim, this new title, just to apply a little bit of distinction, and it would be called herein Our Lady Babylon. Babylon, like all divine feminine aspects, is mother and creator of itself. And to understand this, we look to the Zoharic expansions on the nature of creation. All that exists is created with two capacities, which is to give and to receive. And all things receive from what is above it and give to what is below it, which is one meaning of all waters run down into the sea. A biblical quote. An allusion to Malchut, and in this case, the layers of Babylon's representations. So then let's take a moment to look at the reason why Babylon and Nuit, while being almost interchangeable terms, are used separately. Where you find Nuit, you find really no context for engagement, as then you can't really touch Nuit. Therefore, a reduction in quality must occur into a still metaphysical, but far more tangible form, which we do call Babylon. Now, you may be thinking, what ridiculous syncretism are you subjecting my religion to? Uh, and to be frank, I'm really not too worried about it, as I offer up a fun illusion. The Cobbs is in the Ku, which is to say the stars are in the soul. We time and again see these statements on alluding to the secrets of stars being latent within the personal spirit, so to say. However, it can in fact be inverted as suggested against in the follow-up line, not the Ku in the Cobbs. Beautiful art thou, O Babylon, and desirable, for thou hast given thyself to everything that liveth, and thy weakness has subdued their strength. For in that union, thou didst understand. Therefore, thou art called understanding. O Babylon, Lady of the Night. 
To get into that, the point for the inversion is because there are two perspectives in metaphysical analysis, top down and bottom up. From the human to spirit perspective, we say the stars are in the soul. From the deity to human perspective, we say the stars are within this kind of latent greater soul, which in this case would be Elohim, or in change is Babylon, mother of abominations who contains the firmament on her form, otherwise Newt of the Egyptians. It can suggest that the stars, the souls of man, rest among her form, and she contains all of creation within her, similar to Elohim. As it can be said, she is the Great Mother, or we may signify her as the woman literally clothed in stars. This is a statement on the particular placement in the metaphysical stages as the form above the world of Yetzra, as I called it, the firmament, which has the physical symbol of the stars. And we can even head a little further to every man and woman is a star, which is to suggest thoroughly that we all exist within her generative forces. Much like the biblical concepts of Elohim creating man in the image of the divine force, so too in Thelema do we see the same conception. An extensive degradation of being until a cognizable, self-aware, and limited corporeal form is constructed from dust. And of course, by dust, I simply mean physical matter. With the breath of her kisses has she fermented it, and it hath become the wine of the sacrament, the wine of the Shabbat. And in the holy assembly has she poured it out for her worshippers, and they had become drunken thereon, so that face to face they beheld my father. It would be improper of me to avoid the great secret of Babylon, and the signs and symbols of her chalice or cup. Yet too often do I see the cup brought down to nothing but an idea surrounding either feminine reception or simply being a container or another ritual item. And of course, those are all correct interpretations, but it isn't all about the cup. In fact, the wine in the cup is immensely significant. We can even look to the Judaic ideas surrounding wine for this one, using that terminology of the Sabbath or Shabbat. Wine is, at face value, an intoxicant. But in the spiritual spaces, it is a means of breaking barriers and opening the mind to its inherent nature. You may have never asked, why is it called the wine of Shabbat? To get into it, on Shabbat there's a prayer which is done, and at the peak you're permitted, and in many ways expected, to take a sip of this wine, which has a variety of grand delusions, but in this case it is known as the taking into oneself the great mysteries of the divinity and fulfilling the unification of the divine feminine, or Shekinah, which is... Shabbat, it is the Sabbath, that is her representation. She is a literal presence at this time in space. You can almost look at this in a variety of occult spaces, but this is the understanding that is used. Now, of course, this really has nothing for the idolatrous, and of course I'm just teasing. Anyway, for a bit of clarity, the face-to-face -face conjunction in the text where it says face-to-face -face they beheld my father, in the rabbinical context, is a very special meaning. To really get a touch on these ideas, we have to know Eliphas Levi, who in his writings on magic, or Levi to be more particular, uh, when speaking on Baphomet, talks about witnessing the divinity from face to face, a very antiquated idea in Kabbalistic metaphysics and the Zohar. Uh, it even goes by the name rectification, or tikkun, uh, and I'll paraphrase a writing here for your understanding. The house is watered by the river. At first they were included one within the other, which is why it says created the heavens and the earth. They emerged as one, clinging to each other. Hence, in the beginning, two faces emanated, and we know from earlier that one did cling and the other did not. I'm quite sure you can understand how these illusions fall well into each other, and really into the more graphic descriptions common to Thelemic writing. Obviously, I'm not going to express those, but anyone who is familiar with Thelema knows what I'm talking about. So, you should know that the wine is related to the metaphor of Sod in Kabbalah. Essentially, the mystery of Babylon, her darkness, her accessibility to all but elusive nature, is summarized in a single word, secrets, Sod. And we call this wine, even the wine of the sages and her worshippers who are drunk with those arcane conceptions and admixtures fall into this explanation. We find in the quotation, This is the mystery of Babylon, the mother of abominations, and this is the mystery of her adulteries, for she hath yielded up herself to everything that liveth, and hath become a partaker in its mystery. 
essentially meaning that she is one of the veils to understanding, hence why they call her understanding. You know, and all this mumbo jumbo brings me to a new point. The nature of the divine feminine as shown in the more excessive language of Thelemic writing. Without making it obvious for the sake of online terms of service, we all know the more graphic ways in which Babylon is often described. We know the blunt statements and of the infamous Scarlet Woman. Yet is it really so improper and incorrect? Hilariously, no, it isn't. In fact, human language isn't even strong enough to really properly mirror what it is that these people are attempting to convey. I did describe the nature of creation from a Zoharic perspective and the classical giver and receiver metaphor, yet the receivers of all levels are purely that, receptive, and reach a point of ultimate description that these attempts to explain through, let's say, licentious phrasings can never really begin to inculcate it. It has less to do with the reality of spirituality and everything to do with context and analogy. That which is entirely receptive from what is above it also stands to rule over everything it generates, and we as humans attempt to connect to that nature. Looking at a more hermetic understanding of Kabbalah, we know that to ascend the tree, we seek desperately to grab the higher rungs of mysticism. We must at some point run through these rungs of the spherot or spheres, and to do this, we must both be receptive to that which is above us, to change our nature, and impress our own nature to, to connect with it fully. And impress our own nature to connect with it fully. Hence the intense terminologies and language. If you're willing to lose your mind over it, consider these lines and find out how it applies in absolutely everything from metaphysics to magical practice to, heck, even your job or love or whatever you want to do and consider. So let's go ahead and break down something that you're likely going to ask about. After all of that that has been mentioned, do I believe that Babylon actually has a physical incarnation? Uh, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to save that answer for a little bit later into the video. You know, at this point, you may be tired. I'll admit I am. Or maybe you're really enthralled and you wish this video would never end. But if you thought I'd close there, you're dead wrong. In the representation of the Divine Feminine, we must know that metaphysically, at the bottom, we see the fullest reflection of it. By that I mean the Daughter of Babylon, more greatly represents the form and nature of her being from a more human perspective. And we see, beautiful art thou, O Babylon. And we see this descent of being into, this is the Daughter of Babylon the Beautiful, the Daughter of the King, the Virgin of Eternity, and she that is set upon the throne of understanding. You know, it's just funny, what a twist, am I right? The Virgin of Eternity? The real mystery of Babylon isn't just that secrets are existent and dwelled in by the sagacious minds of the desiring who seek her. No, it is that truth. The whole truth, from the Thelemic perspective, is unable to be perverted. Rather, it is perfected and unchanging, just like the great red stone of the philosophers in alchemy. So, what then, right? <laughs> But what is the grand mystery behind these things? Is there an incarnate Scarlet Woman? Is it all mystery and metaphysics? Is it this one girl who never texted you back? Is it the Scarlet Woman exists? She does have an incarnation. She does descend into the bowels of creation to partake of them. In fact, the highest revelation, the most relevant information that can be had regarding the Scarlet Woman as existent is in full truth, actually, you b****!